Welcome. I'm Roland Green, director of the Stanford Humanities Center. And all of us here are delighted that you're joining us for our first event of 2021. Today's talk is part of a new series we launched last summer called Inside the Center, highlighting current and recent fellows. The series directs attention to some of the most provocative, groundbreaking and unusual work that is happening under our roof in the building you see behind me. Everyone is welcome to watch these presentations, of course, and to pose questions. And I want to extend a special greeting to former fellows at our center who may be joining us today. Welcome back. When I became director a little over a year ago, on the eve of our 40th anniversary celebration, it seemed the right opportunity to reinforce the center's purpose, to expand our programs and to uphold our distinctive role on campus, which is to bring the freshest, most exciting ideas in the broader humanities to Stanford. Among other things, we have launched three other series of new events, one highlighting research by the newest members of our faculty community, another exploring emerging paradigms across the humanities, and the third recognizing figures whose research lends itself to social change. Today's event, which features a current Humanity Center fellow, Usha Ayer, is co-sponsored with the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, or CCSRE, and the Center for South Asia at Stanford. I'm happy to have as my co-host today, Jennifer Devere Brody, Professor of Theater and Performance Studies at Stanford and currently Faculty Director of CCSRE, where Professor Ayer currently concurrently holds a second fellowship this academic year. Jennifer, thank you for partnering with us. Thank you so much, Roland. I'm very pleased to be here and welcome to everyone. I'm grateful to the center uh, staff, both at the Humanities Center and the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. Let me acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Muwethma Ohlone peoples. And CCSR3, CCSRE is very excited to be partnering here with you today. And we look forward to future connections with the Humanities Center via our Mellon-funded Centering Race and the Humanities Consortium with Yale, Brown, and the University of Chicago. Today, we honor the work of Professor Usha Iyer, who is one of three Stanford colleagues who's been named a faculty fellow at the center. The other two are Matt Clare in sociology and John Krosnick in political science, communication and psychology. And his Chautauqua is coming up in the spring. We'll let you know about that. So for the last decade, this program has celebrated new works in race and ethnicity written by Stanford colleagues. And I welcome you on behalf of everyone involved with Stanford Center for Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity in its 25th year to follow our programs. Um, we're really very, very pleased to be partnering today and especially to talk about dancing women. So back to you, Roland. Thank you, Jennifer. Now, before we meet Professor Ayer, I'd like to mention that today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website in the coming days. Also, if you would like to submit a question to the speaker, either during the talk or in the Q&A period afterwards, please use the Q&A box in Zoom and we will do our best to get to as many questions as we can. So we, as I've mentioned, uh, it's our pleasure today to welcome Usha Ayer, who will discuss her new book, Dancing Women Choreographing Corporeal Histories of Hindi Cinema. Since 2016, Professor Ayer has been Assistant Professor of Film and Media Studies at Stanford. She is an affiliated faculty member at the Center for South Asia and the CCSRE. In 2018-19, she was a fellow at the Clayman Institute for Gender Research. Her essays have appeared in the journals Camera Obscura and South Asian Popular Culture, and a number are in print or forthcoming in edited collections such as the Oxford Handbook of Film Theory and the Blackwell Companion to Indian Cinema. Professor Ayer serves as associate editor of South Asia, the Journal of South Asian Studies. Usha, thank you so much for joining us today and we're, there's so much anticipation for your talk, so please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roland and Jennifer, for that warm and generous introduction. Um, and much gratitude to the Humanities Center, the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and the Center for South Asia, three of my homes in addition to my department on our campus, uh, for sponsoring this event. 
Uh, many thanks also to the wonderful staff at the Stanford Humanities Center for everything you're doing to make our fellowship year as rich and productive as possible under these conditions. Um, I'm just so delighted to have my book come out and to start work on the next one during this fellowship year at both the Humanities Center and at CCSRE. And a big and warm thank you to all of you attending this talk during what is a very eventful week here in the US. Um, I look forward to hearing more of your thoughts during the Q&A section. I'll share my screen now um, as I move into the presentation. And I must warn you that the video might be a little choppy, but that's just how Zoom works. Um, and so don't worry about, uh, don't worry if you find your videos or the video clips are a little choppy. I'll begin by laying out some of the broad outlines of the book and then move to sections from a chapter that looks closely at relationships between bodies, space and movement. Dancing Women Choreographing Corporeal Histories of Hindi Cinema is a study of the material and cultural production of film dance in relation to the construction of cinematic narratives, performing bodies, and spectator citizens. To clarify, in case you're not familiar with uh, popular Indian cinema, films are made in over 30 languages in India, with the Hindi language film mainly produced in the western city of Bombay being among the most prolific and popular, but there are many more extremely popular and prolific cinemas, especially in southern India, as you'll see on this very schematic map over here. I'll alternately refer to, uh, to these films as Hindi or Bombay cinema, the city where they're mainly made. Back to the book, the book specifically undertakes an examination of film dance and female performance in popular Hindi cinema from the 1930s to the 1990s to explore how the dynamic figurations of the body wrought by cinematic dance forms produce unique constructions of gender, sexuality, stardom, and spectacle. And why women? Quite simply because they were the primary performers of dance in Hindi cinema until the late 1990s. A focus on the routine picturization of solo dance numbers with female performers reveals how gender plays a central role in the discourses of censorship and spectacle that animate film dance. The attempted but routinely foiled regulation of dance practices and movement vocabularies reveals desires and anxieties around women's visibility, mobility, and participation in the public sphere. And I'm just including a whole series of GIFs so you get a sense across time of the varied formations of the female dancing body. To start off, let's consider very briefly the early history of dance on film. And here are some examples of this. As forms invested in the exploration and exhibition of movement, cinema and dance have had a long history of engagement. Cinema enlisted dance from its very beginning. In films like Dixon Experimental Sound Film and Annabelle the Dancer, which you see bits of on the screen here, the Edison Manufacturing Company used dancers to demonstrate to first time spectators cinema's propensity for the spectacular display of movement. Dance along with acrobatics and other forms of physical display was employed to showcase the immense kinetic potential of the new medium of film. Laurent Guido remarks, quote, dance just as sports and gymnastics imposed itself at the beginning of the 20th century as a harmonious way of organizing body movement. It was considered that the muscular mimicry put into motion by physical performance would position film spectators under an irresistible rhythmic spell, end quote. In India as well, from the introduction of film technology in the early 1900s, there is a similar interest in capturing dance on celluloid. By the time we get to the late silent film Dilair Jigar or Gallant Hearts, one of the few surviving pre-sound Indian films, we notice a movement away from the earlier frontal tableau presentation where characters would come and dance in front of the camera, but the camera itself wouldn't move that much. We see now multiple dynamization techniques which are employed to present the heroine Saranga that you see on screen to present her performance. 
Despite the absence of sound, we get a sense of rhythm from Saranga's movements, the playing of the tambourine and drum, and the frequent intercutting between shots at various camera at varying camera distance. The quality of these clips is pretty poor, but I hope you get a sense. I wanted to give you a sense of pre-sound dance as well before we move centrally into sound film. Gallant Hearts adds dance to the film's swashbuckling action to generate a hectic spectacle of attractions that would come to define the masala film form of popular Hindi cinema. Masala referring to a spice mix, and in the case of popular Indian cinema, the routine combination within any film and genre of melodrama, romance, song and dance, fight and comic sequences. Over the following decades, Hindi film dance eclectically borrows from various classical and folk dance forms in the Indian subcontinent and beyond, and also adopts freely the vocabularies of transnational forms, such as cha-cha-cha, belly dance, salsa, swing, etc. The adroit and hectic heterogeneity of Hindi film dance makes it a profoundly modern dance form, countering accounts of the absence of modern dance in India. Popular film dance is, in fact, a vital space of experimentation, where different gestural systems are mixed through a mongrel logic to produce choreographies of great affective force. A lot of the study of Hindi film song and dance numbers has focused on music, mise-en-scene, the relationship of the musical number to the narrative, and has treated the song and dance sequence as a combined identity. My book's focus on the display and mobilization of the dancing body proposes new models for theorizing the Hindi film song and dance sequence. It advances questions asked less often of the song and dance composite form, such as how do dancer actors impact the cinematic narratives and the music composed for them? What is the difference in our spectatorial engagement with dance numbers versus only sung performances? How is the on-screen mobility and stardom of the dancer-actress constructed differently than that of actresses not renowned for their dancing skills? I have here some examples of vocal performance. There is a playback singer who's singing for both of these actresses, but one is well known for her dancing and the other not. These inquiries are generative of new frameworks for analyzing labor, production economies, cultural memory of cinema, and taste hierarchies. I wasn't interested, for instance, in providing an account of the quote unquote great dancers of popular Indi Indian cinema, though many of the celebrated ones feature extensively in the book. Rather, the book aims to understand how dancer actresses and other film dance workers participate in and produce major shifts in the film industry. How on-screen dance negotiates social changes, including in the participation of women in the public sphere and the relationship between dance and film technology. Another major driving question is the pleasure we experience in watching dance numbers. Why they make our hair stand on end, our fingers snap, our toes tap, and equally the joy and pride of performers and other film personnel in their work. This leads in the book to a foregrounding of collaborative experimentation and creativity, which is often erased when we tell us history of cinema only through particular directors and stars, which is typically how these histories are told. Through a focus on genealogical and professional histories, training and labor, the book produces a different kind of narrative about female labor in the Bombay film industry, one that centers experimentation, collaboration, and virtuosity in the careers of Hindi cinema's dancing women. A material history of the labor of producing on-screen dance demonstrates how dancing women of various caste, race, religious, and class configurations co-choreograph the landscape of Bombay cinema. A collaborative framework captures the complex intermedial corporeal history of film dance production, making visible the bodies whose labor is rendered immaterial. The labor of these ghost or shadow figures is central to the production of the dancing star, but is often pushed to the background, throwing a long dark shadow on the spotlighted histories of acclaimed, of acclaimed dancers and film stars. 
Ghost figures marginalized at various historical junctures include traditional performers such as Tawaifs or courtesans and Devadasis or temple who were temple court and salon dancers. The cinematic vamp, we'll see much more of her during the talk today, the behind the scenes choreographer and numerous nameless background dancers as backup dancers were known in the Bombay film industry. The book's historical attention to these various dancing figures over the 19th and 20th centuries made it apparent that one could not tell the story of dancing heroines without invoking all these other dancing women. I started off when I wrote uh, my PhD dissertation, uh, I imagined it as a story about the dancing heroine, but the attention to all of these other figures fundamentally changed the project and the title. Consider, for instance, in this folding of multiple bodies, the Anglo-Indian or Eurasian backup dancer Philomena Leon's legs replacing the star Madhubala's legs. These are the black and white images that you see on top there. Or how in Pakiza, a 1972 film, in the final dance number of this film, the star Meena Kumari's footwork on broken glass was actually performed by her dancing double Padma Khanna. In these instances, the figure of the on-screen dancing woman quite literally folds in the limbs, torsos, and gestures of various and variously coded dancing bodies. When we trace material, industrial practices, and logics, we begin to formulate a corporeal history that is peopled by many bodies, with agency and authorship dispersed over numerous acknowledged and invisibilized actors. To illustrate some of these questions that undergird the book's approach, and for those of you who might not be too familiar with Hindi film dance numbers, let's watch a portion of a spectacular sequence from the 1969 film, Prince. And this is where the video might be a little choppy. Dance off features, and they go through multiple dance styles uh, in the three stanzas of the song. It features Bombay cinema's three best known dancer actors of the time. The Bharatanatyam trained heroine Vaijanti Mala and Bharatanatyam being a quote unquote classical dance form. The mixed race Helen who routinely featured as a dancing vamp over three decades and to whom we'll return uh, throughout this talk. And the loose limbed Shami Kapoor sometimes referred to as the Elvis Presley of India. This dance number staging of a techno spectacle of cine choreographic innovations, dazzling costume and set design, and an array of musical and dance styles alerts us to questions of virtuosity, labor, and pleasure undergirding the production and reception of popular Hindi film dance. While the film's plot undertakes many contortions to stage this dance number, when we shift our focus from narrative to bodily performance, to the corporeal competence and protracted training required for dancing and to the spectatorial desires that screening dancing bodies activate, we may discern that spectacle is the narrative when dancing stars like these come together on screen. Dance scholar Jane Desmond describes the dancing body as, quote, a ground for the inscription of meaning, a tool for its enactment, and a medium for its continual creation and recreation." End quote. We may read Vijayanti Mala, Shami Kapoor, and Helen's bodies as writing and written upon, as interpolated materializations of biology, history, and technology. Helen's supple twisting torso, mobile mouth, and splayed legs Vaijanti Mala's large coal-lined eyes, straight-backed stance, um, and her crisp mudras or codified gestures, which come from her Bharatanatyam training, and Kapoor's seemingly unchoreographed insouciance disclose the accumulated somatics experiences of each performer, disciplined into certain styles of comportment that have sedimented layers of gestures in each body. Gestural systems, Henri Lefebvre notes, embody ideology and bind it to practice. Through gestures, ideology escapes from pure abstraction and performs actions, end quote. Helen's cabaret and Vijayanti Mala's classical dance routines bear the traces of long histories of the performing arts and of gendered performativity in the Indian subcontinent. 
They fold in figurations of hybrid quote unquote oriental dances from the 1930s, the Anglo-Indian dancing girl from Bombay cinema and the newly anointed classical dancer, which is why I have it in quotes and I'll explain. Uh, the newly anointed classical dancer who emerges in the 40s and the 50s through a concerted marginalization of hereditary performers such as Devadasis and Tavaifs. So the category of classic of the classical is artificially constructed during through this anti-colonial period. And I spent some time in the book talking about it. Each performer in this dance number mobilizes thus a gestural history not just of their own star bodies, but also of popular Hindi cinema's borrowings from other performance traditions and cinematic idioms. Attending to Vaijanti Mala's fingers and feet, Helen's waist, or Shami Kapoor's tremulous head, as indeed the choreography, cinematography, and editing pointedly invite us to do, provides a means of constructing a historiography of popular cultural forms and trans-regional exchanges through the dancing body. Analyzing the collision and coalescence of cultural forms in the bodies of dancer actors illuminates how the planes of the popular and the classical, the regional, the national, and the global are negotiated and articulated by Hindi film dance. In addition to the social practices that construct bodies, dance forces us to attend to the corporeal materiality of performing bodies. The dancer actress is employed here as an analytical category, acting as a nexus for relations between industry, narrative, and spectatorship, but also as a material artifact composed of limbs, flesh, bone, and skin. The neuromusculature of the dancing body draws our gaze to both anatomical surface and ideological depth, or indeed the reverse to the depth of the performing body beneath its ideological inscriptions, as for instance, chaste, salacious, traditional, modern, heroine, vamp, etc. Adrian McLean asks, quote, which parts of the body are allowed to speak and perform and in what contexts? Which parts of the body repeat the discursive meaning already placed on bodies by culture? What kinds of physical training and competence produce what effects?" End quote. The dance off in popular Hindi cinema has typically been read as corporealizing the post-colonial conflict of modernity and tradition through its binary of Western and state-sanctioned Indian dance styles. I discuss in the book the Indian state's project of classifying and canonizing only particular dance forms as classical and folk in the 1950s, which is why these categories are problematic. However, by placing Vaijanti Mala's quote unquote Indian and Helen's quote unquote Western dancing bodies next to rather than an opposition to each other, by showing us their delight in each other's performance, and by sharing performance space equally and time, performance space and time equally between the heroine, the vamp, and the hero, this dance number moves away from tired modernity uh, and tradition and modernity cliches, presenting instead a radical celebration of the performative repertoire of each of these dancing bodies. It also enables a reading of the hybridity of both the Western and the Indian dance forms. The three performers routines all mix various styles. And this is often why film dance has been criticized, but that's only if you stick to those kind of strict um, nationalist definitions of authenticity. Rather, their, their performative repertoires gesture in turn to the continuous processes of corporeal figurations through the colonial and the post-colonial periods, rather than presenting them as discrete and bound by rigid discourses of authenticity. A focus on the materiality of dancing bodies draws our attention as well to the spaces between bodies and to the shifting registers of agency and desire articulated by film dance and its female practitioners. Countering industrial and class hierarchies between the A-list heroine and the lower rung ramp, uh, lower rung vamp, Vaijanti Mala is reported to have been icy towards the hero Shami Kapoor on set, but warmly remarks about Helen in her memoir, quote, Helen is one person with whom I really got along in the industry as we were both equally reticent, no talking, just working on the sets, end quote. This account of the bond between the hardworking, the two hardworking dancer actresses 
prompts us to consider flows and linkages between performing bodies and to revise our assumptions about relations between the, uh, between the supposedly taciturn and traditional heroine, the immodest westernized vamp, and the flamboyant hero. These are the types that ideological readings kind of fix us into. The three dancing stars, each a particular assemblage of gestures and intensities, are by the time of the production of this number mature performers at the height of their dancing powers. But the affective force of the dance number is produced not only by the on-screen dancing body. I advance the concept of a multi-bodied choreomusicing body, which is a composite of on-screen dancers as well as off-screen choreographers playback singers, musicians, directors, cinematographers, editors, set and costume designers, focus pullers, carpenters, among many other personnel. Shifting attention from the ideological work performed by the song and dance sequence, which has dominated the study of the Hollywood musical or of popular Indian cinema, to, uh, to quote two examples, we, when we shift our attention to studying the industrial practices, training, rehearsal, and personnel required for these attractions, we produce a different history and theorization of labor, materiality, and the economies of production. In the on-screen dance number, we do not see the markings on the floor for camera and dance placement, the sweating under the studio lights, the time taken for costume changes. However, close attention to the production of film dance spectacle prompts an exploration of the interfaces of bodies, surfaces, spaces, and temporalities, which in turn drives an examination of popular Hindi cinema's figurations through its affects, its materialities, and strategies for evoking spectatorial desire and pleasure. Vaijayanti Mala notes of Mukabla Hamsena Karo, the, the song that we just watched a clip from, she says, it clicked so well, it made your toes curl. She highlights here our intense somatic engagement with Hindi cinema's dance numbers, which produce an embodied and kinesthetic spectatorship. The dance numbers aesthetic of excess accords with the promise of all popular cinemas to exceed the limitations of the mundane and the quotidian. Enacting, as Erin Brannigan notes, quote, the human potential for physical virtuosity and play, end quote. And this excess somatic energy produces spectatorial responses, such as goosebumps, tapping feet, snapping fingers, etc., that are located centrally in our bodies. For more toe curling somatic responses, let's turn centrally to Helen and the Hindi film Cabaret. I draw here from the chapter titled Choreographing Architectures of Public Intimacy, a Spatio-Corporeal Approach to Hindi Film Dance. The most memorable musical number in the 1971 film Caravan remains Pia Tu Abto Aja. We'll watch a clip just now. It wins Asha Bhosle, the, the Filmfare Award for Best Female Playback Singer, similar to the Oscars in Hollywood. Featuring, it features an extravagant multiplanar set and is celebrated as one of the dancer actress Helen's most elaborately choreographed cabaret numbers. The cine choreography attesting to the skill and virtuosity of the choreo musicing body that, collect, that collectively produces these dance numbers. So let's watch a bit of this cabaret number. As Helen's character, Monica, hears her lover call, she rises from her slump, caressing her fear, tracking back in sync with her as she sighs and heaves towards it. We then get real excess all over her very mobile face and body with her elegant sensory logics of the cabaret experience. The next shot shows Helen mobilizing with her side shimmy, an elaborate aerial crane shot along the hotel bar, a wallpaper of flamingos, and the slide that now offers a diagonal vector to the composition as she strokes and sidles up against it. Within a few moments of the opening of the number, we see, hear, and feel the pulsating rhythm of the cabaret assemblage as the camera glides, swoops, and crawls on the ground, producing an intense embodied intimacy with Helen's Monica. Even as the playback singer Asha Bhosle's throaty singing and heavy breathing and music composer R.D. Berman scores brisk tempo and high rhythmic density produce what we might call a music of the body. 
cinematographer Munir Khan, choreographer Suresh Bhatt, and art director Shanti Das, who each had four decade long careers. And I don't have images of them because these behind the scenes technicians are not recorded in the histories that we have. They worked on numerous films from the 1950s through the 1990s and are key members of this numbers choreo musicking body. They produce planes of action via lighting, props, camera cranes, tracks, tilts, and pans through which Helen's dancing body participates in multiple modes of engagement with the built space around her. While there has been extended discussion of the ideological production of femininity through the on-screen bifurcation between the Hindi film Vamp and Heroine, you will notice quite easily the vamp figuration and the sequined clothes, the, the showing of skin and the heroine in a traditional sari, uh, clinging on to the hero for protection, etc. While this has been a common reading, if we shift from a narrative to a spectacular logic, we uncover the production processes behind the fetishized space of the cabaret to examine how it is in fact a central location for Hindi cinema's generation of particular spatio-sensory pleasures. While popular Indian cinema has always negotiated sexual desire through musical numbers, certain spatio-corporeal formations like the cabaret and the cinematic kotha produce a specific geography of affects that might explain why they continue to inform the cine choreography of dance numbers in Bollywood today. The kotha, which you see in the GIF above, is where is the space for the Islamicate tawaif, uh, often a Muslim character, but even if not Muslim figured as uh, displaying gestures that would be connected to South Asian Islamic identity. That's why the, the adjective Islamicate. Um, the Tawaya for the courtesan's performance space is the Kota. It's a particular architectural environment as well as a social and performance space of poetry, of drinking, of, um, of connection with the audience, uh, which is why I read both of these spaces together in the chapter, but I'll only focus on the cabaret in the talk today. I'll discuss how the cabaret in particular serves as the impulse for a range of exceptional constructions of bodies, movements, and spaces to produce what I refer to as architectures of public intimacy. So what is the Hindi film cabaret? From the 1950s to the 1980s, the cabaret functioned as one of Hindi cinema's stock locations and performative repertoires. Ranjini Mazumdar describes it as, quote, an illicit landscape of gambling, gangsters, and smugglers, and the excessive and dangerous display of female sexuality, end quote. The cabaret was a virtual space that mainly existed in the cinematic imagination as the location for the vamps dance, a provocative westernized floor show also referred to as the cabaret. The use of the same word to describe the space and the dance coded by this erotic movement vocabulary attests to their imbrication and the difficulty in determining whether the space was conceived first or new dancing bodies in the 50s demanded its creation. Let's return to Helen's cabaret number that we watched a bit of just now to examine how cinematic processes are written through by a variety of choreographic operations. After the opening segment we just watched, we learned that Helen is performing this cabaret number for a large audience of seated spectators, including the, heroine, the film's heroine, Sunita, who it must be noted sits still quite literally petrified throughout this number, the camera framing her in a static medium close-up. The moral looseness, as it were, of the vamp, on the other hand, loosens the camera itself into delirious movement. In an interview, Helen remarks, quote, every girl should flirt with the man who's handling the camera and not with the hero, producer, or the director. If she makes the photographer feel wanted, he'll make her look gorgeous, giving her an edge over the leading lady, end quote. This privileging of the relationship between the dancing vamp and the cinematographer is revelatory of the representational logics of the cabaret assemblage as Helen routinely mobilizes spatial cinematic infrastructures, such as camera trolleys, color film stock, and sliding ramps through her libidinous dance moves. The explosion of color in, in the cabaret sequence is what introduces color, in fact, into uh, popular Hindi cinema in the 1960s. 
Marking the transition to the next stanza of the song, she leaps to the floor, drawing the camera close to the ground, toppling the vertical plane by performing her sinuous in undulations in the horizontal dimension, in stark contrast to the physically and morally upright heroine. Through its radial geometries and multi-dimensional figuring of space, the cine choreography of the cabaret assemblage produces in us a dizzying, voluptuous, and carnally dense response. Indeed, this kind of floor work, a regular feature of the cabaret's grammar, displaces the distancing effects of the perspectival organization of the proscenium stage, also a common space for the staging of Hindi film dance, and of other dance architectures that emphasize the separation of audience and performer. The kinesthetic spaces of the cabaret allow for, and indeed are produced by the vamp wrapping herself around architectural features, objects like tables and bar tops, not to mention members of the audience, laying a hand on a man's thigh here, a sequence stocking leg on a table there. I propose in the book, a body space movement framework to read the spatiocorporeal figuration of screen dance. Within the field of dance studies, there has been some investigation of the relationship between dance and space, where through motion, dance is understood to, to use space as well as to create it and to define the properties of the space it creates. As performance theorist Peggy Phelan notes, quote, while it is true that bodies usually manage to move in time and space, dancing consciously performs the body's discovery of its temporal and spatial dimensions, end quote. The intertwined relationship of dance and space, of movement and environment, is apparent in the spaces mobilized by Hindi cinema for the staging of dance, ranging from the stage, princely courts, the kota, the temple, the cabaret, weddings, discotheques, bedrooms, hilltops, and fields, among many others. A consideration of these spaces prompts a number of questions. How do these spaces affect the kinds of dance performed in them? At the same time, how are these cinematic spaces defined by these dance vocabularies? What is the relationship, in other words, between performer, movement vocabulary, and the space of performance? In his book, The Production of Space, Henri Lefebvre develops the central argument that every society and within it, every mode of production constructs its own space. I won't go into details here as I do in the book, but we may consider film dance as a mode of production that produces its own spatial practices through particular gestural regimes and rhythms of music, movement, editing, etc. The cinematographer's tracking movement, the choreographer's off-camera demonstration of moves, the editor's fingers cutting a shot, all harmonize into a spatial choreography generated through the labor of film dance production. While the studio floor or outdoor location for dance performance is designed as what Lefebvre would call an abstract space by the film industry for profit, through its use by the dancing bodies of choreographers and performers, it also becomes a representational space that is lived in particular ways. Additionally, it is not just the space of performance, but the spaces between performers, between the central dancing figures as well as between the lead dancers and the background dancers that gesture to the cultural, aesthetic, and industrial logics of Bombay cinema's construction of gendered and classed bodies. Studying the shifts in these spaces offers one way of narrating a corporeal history of popular Hindi cinema, a history of representations through a history of spaces, as it were. Lefebvre remarks, quote, understandings of the body are radically affected by the history of spaces, end quote. This folds in the temporal dimensions of history as well, for through the image of a tree trunk, Lefebvre theorizes the imbrication of space and time, quote, each place showed its age and like a tree trunk bore the mark of the years it had taken to grow. Time was thus inscribed in space, end quote. The image of the tree trunk prompts a reflection on the spaces of dance in terms of sedimentation and accumulation, where film dance spaces bear traces of gestures, movements, bodies, and music that tell a layered story of the production of spectacle in Indian cinema. 
As film sets are erected and dismantled, used and reused, they're traversed by multiple laboring bodies. Of the workers who construct and paint the sets, the dress walas or costume assistants who procure the costumes that will inhabit and produce the space of dance, the musicians who create the acoustic space, for space is not constructed only optically, but also through the sonorous, the haptic, the sensorial, and not least the dancers who make the space come alive. The body space movement allows us for imagining a wide range of networks and pathways of production economies, film stock, mise-en-scene elements, music, body cultures, social discourses on respectability and gender norms, among many others, that contribute to the production of the representational regimes and the affective intensities of film dance. Uh, this is, I, I wanted to show the clip, but I don't think we have the time. So I'm just gonna let the GIF play on screen while I speak over it. In her analysis of architecture as an inhabiting force within choreography, choreographer scholar Carol Brown argues that the materiality of the body coincides with the materiality of the space, which allows for a matrixial set of relationships between body, space, and architecture. Brown describes the spatio-corporeal field as, quote, a transgressive threshold of co-emergence for the dancing subject and the unfolding spaces within choreography as encounter, end quote. Drawing on Rudolf Laban's vision of dance as a living architecture, where space acts as a precondition of movement and movement as a visible aspect of space, Brown refers to dance architectures as allowing for choreography to emerge through an enfolding between somatic awareness and sceno architecture, as you see Helen weaving her way between bodies and objects um, and creating the space as she moves through it. The dance architectures of the cabaret nightclub help uncover the social relationships latent in spaces. Social scripts are deposited on every space and uncovering this history requires deconstructing the uncertain traces left on the space by social activities. For Lefebvre, repetitious spaces such as highways and airports are the outcome of repetitive gestures. Hindi cinema's repetitive dancing spaces such as the cabaret and the kota produce and are produced by the gestures of the westernized vamp and the Islamicate tawaif their bodies, both agents and products, generative of and responsive to the spatio-corporeal logics of film dance. Reading choreography as a matrix of relationships between the body and the built, between performers and audience, let's watch a bit of a cabaret number from the 1967 film, Jewel Thief. Uh, this will be our final clip. <laughs> ostrich feathered sequin clad dancing body twirls amidst the audience manipulating space as a pliable material of her dance her dance demands a discontinuous space containing multiple dimensions that are then rendered cinematically contiguous through the deeply tactile vibratory and kinesthetic cine choreography of the cabaret number the Franco-Burmese Helen, who literally crossed militarized India-Burma, now Myanmar, borders during World War II to enter the Bombay film industry in the 1940s, figuratively functions as a border-crossing provocator who produces a vibrant commons through the cabaret, where otherwise regulated intimacies find expression. I'm happy to discuss further in the Q&A the kind of racial dynamics at play over here. 
Given the internal audience's active participation in the cabaret's geography of affects with its own gestural repertoire in sync with the performer, whether nodding, toe tapping or sweating from the proximity of the vamp's corporeal excess, these, uh, it becomes apparent that the cabaret's choreography generates a distinctive organization of physicality for both the performer and the viewer. The space and the spatial practices of the cabaret allow for multi-sensory engagements between bodies, ocular, acoustic, haptic, and even gustatory with the ritual pouring of libations. In the mediated sensorium of the cabaret, audiences don't just watch a performance, but experience an entire gamut of affects. Helen and her bodies fold upon each other, choreographing architectures of public intimacy. Helen and her dance double are framed between each other's gyrating bodies, rubbing up against themselves and the people seated at the bar, who in turn, infected by the contagion of the two women's dancing women's movements, sway in and out of various same and opposite sexed couple formations. Through a spectacular regime of dance performance and reception, the cabaret const constitutes a commons for the expression of the libidinal energies of public intimacy. Lefebvre's discussion of leisure spaces like beach resorts as eroticized spaces of consumption specifically designed, designated for sex, pleasure, and physical gratification comes to mind in relation to the cabaret, a space eroticized by the performative repertoires of both performing and spectating bodies. And what of us, the external spectators, and our somatic response to the cine choreography of the cabaret? As the vamp directly gazes at us, and this is very common of the vamp's direct address to her audience and the audience in the movie theater, the camera is often in hectic motion. Uh, in his analysis of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man film, Scott Richmond posits that the elaborate choreography of camera movements in these films, in his case, superhero films, puts us, quote, less in the position of Spider-Man or Peter and more in the position of a dance partner in a kind of superhero padada, end quote. He positions us as dance partners who are not at all in control. We are flung around in unexpected ways and very probably enjoying this disorientation. The cabaret assemblage with a spectacularly mobile dancing woman and cine choreography affects a temporary unbounding of our ordinary perceptual and proprioceptive self-possession. In the mobility of the on-screen body, the camera, and the moved spectator, we ascertain a tripartite production of what dance scholars have referred to as kinesthetic empathy, where perception is grounded not just in the eye, but in the entire body, so that when watching a dance, we are literally dancing along. Positing both dancer and spectator's bodies as moving and movable, affected and affecting, allows for a theorizing of performance and reception that is somatically agentive and counters one-way logics of film spectatorship. Through a combination of bodies and techniques then, cabaret cine choreography produces a reciprocal and intimate intersubjectivity between performers and spectators. And I'll conclude now. Um, with a clip, uh, with, a, with some images, Elizabeth Gross argues that, quote, the limits of possible spaces are the limits of possible modes of corporeality, end quote. Through her dancing body, the vamp, and Helen in particular, produces and inhabits the heterotopic space of the cabaret, which mobilizes otherwise incompatible spaces to produce these pulsating architectures of public intimacy in Hindi cinema. A focus on spatial configurations of film dance makes apparent that the dancing body is not only a biological object, but also a mode of perception and expression that operates as a site of encounter with spaces and objects and produces a textured system of folds between subjectivities, surfaces, and sensations. Intermedial theorizations of cinema, music, and dance help us understand the production of and our responses to dermal architectural audiovisual folds where multiple performance and labor practices conjoin their materialities and intensities. The methodological import of such a reading practice <coughs> 
Attentive to collaboration and intermediality is not limited to analyzing musical sequences in films. It can alert us to the potential for writing labor and material histories through attention to the gestural traditions of various industrial formations. So finally, by analyzing how the dancing woman's harnessing of cinematic technologies to capture her moving body renders the dance number a site of maximal formal innovation, a techno spectacle, Dancing Women demonstrates how the production of gender and spectacle happen in complex multi-sensory ways. Rather than just limit our reading to the framework of ideological suspicion in relation to the male gaze, industrial exploitation and the like, a corporeally grounded critical gaze notices how these techno spectacles work to generate pleasure, determining the very comportment of our bodies as we watch films and remaining often as our only memories of certain films. Cinema is part of a larger complex of corporeal practices, and the dancing women that populate this book foreground the labor, the skill, and the virtuosity of the many on and off screen bodies that produce the processes and the pleasures of popular Hindi cinema. And let's stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that brilliant paper and, of course, the book from which you have drawn your presentation today. We are very grateful. Um, there are a number of questions. Uh, I hope we get to talk about some of the issues around uh, transnationalism and the origin of dancing. Uh, particularly as I look at these and think about Josephine Baker as a kind of interlocutor with Helen's performances, or um, you know, just to say quickly that uh, unlike Shane Vogel's really interesting discussion around the cabaret performances of Lena Horne, uh, which were not necessarily filmed, but um, where she he talks about her in performance, her ability not to uh, give her body to a particular kind of audience in her performances. Um, we have some questions in the chat, which we'll get to momentarily, exactly around this question of the sensuality uh, of the dance, particularly in Helen's performances. So, you know, again, wonderful work on focusing on the spectatorial logic, the non-diegetic production of these dances, uh, and of course, dance on film and giving us a new way to read them via the laboring body. I want to begin our first questions uh, with, uh, our host co-host today, Professor Green, and he will ask a first question. We have lots coming in through the chat. We will have time to get to them. And uh, we will stop a little bit before two because we have a very special uh, announcement. So I'll turn it back to Roland at the end of uh, our discussion. So Professor Green, will you ask the first question? Let me, I will do that. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Usha, Thanks again for the wonderful talk. And what I want to start with is a question that is uh, at the intersection of, of, of your chosen materials and your uh, critical method. You mentioned early on that you weren't interested in questions of taste and of hierarchies, and uh, your examples all draw from uh, popular cinema, of course. How does popular culture in particular lend itself to the kind of approach you're taking here, what you call a corporeal history. And what might be the uh, value of this kind of corporeal history for other cultural objects or for other traditions of performance? Thanks so much, Rodin. And that's a question that I often have to think about when I choose what materials I'm going to present, especially to an audience that might not be familiar with Hindi mm -hmm. film dance or with the cabaret. As my students often are, when I'm showing them popular Indian films, they're surprised that there are no sex scenes, but there are these extremely salacious dance numbers that they're embarrassed by almost. Um, but I'm kind of, you know, one can go to Susan Sontag and Notes on Camp and talk about how in some ways camp taste turns its back on this kind of question, this axis of good and bad, good and bad axis of taste, of aesthetic judgment. Uh, and instead camp as a mode of enjoyment, not of judgment. It's generous, it wants to enjoy. So when we take seriously that question of pleasure and analyze it and think about where a feminist spectator is getting her pleasure in the cabaret number from, we have to turn to 
to kind of theorizations of popular culture. Cultural studies is kind of built on this and Stuart Hall is extremely important, for instance, for me, uh, where he talks about popular culture as profoundly mythic. It's not a simple reflection of our identities and identifications, but it's a kind of theater of desires and of fantasies. Um, and that if we want to understand, it's an arena of, of deep feelings that we mm. barely understand, right? So what are these deep feelings that popular culture kind of activates in, that, uh, in us? It could be Lena Horn, it could be Josephine Baker, it could be a whole range of figures. For me, it could be Rihanna's latest video or Cardi B's latest video, right? How do you make these important objects of analysis holding and I find what's hardest I don't find it as hard to kind of address the ideological suspicion but that pleasure and desire are actually so slippery that analyze in analyzing them you may lose that so how do you actually make the analysis also convey the the enjoyment and the pleasure that you experience from these objects without at all erasing all of the violence and the exploitation that we know undergirds all activity, right? Which is why I constantly refer to them as labor his histories and material histories. The book spends a lot of time talking about religion and caste, um, which doesn't come up as much in this chapter, but it does in other chapters. And as I mentioned, we could talk about Helen's, uh, the cabaret is a racially coded space as well. Um, but the other part of your question about makes me also think about popular culture versus art cinema. I could have had a chapter on dance in popular in Indian art film. Art cinema is often read within our discipline as auteur centric. So you go to watch an Antonioni or a Satyajit Ray or a Kurosawa film. You don't go and you don't say I'm going to watch uh, the film of a particular star. I'm not going to watch a Gene Kelly film, right? So the very identification. We rarely hear about technicians or there is very little work on performance and acting in art cinema. I wish there were much more. So in those instances, cinema is read along literary lines uh, where it's the film is seen as emerging from the genius mind of a single, an individual, much like a literary author, often male, um, and with state funding as a lot of art cinema cultures are produced with state funding for the international festival circuit. And I'm not putting it down. I have a great love for various art cinemas. I teach courses, but I want us to think about that as well as in the, as an industrial formation. How do we bring this kind of industrial material corporeal logic to everything we study and kind of destabilize the art industry binary? And when we do that, we kind of, popular culture is already a very diffuse terrain of pleasure. So it helps to parse corporeal affects. It's, it lends itself to it. Uh, the art cinema in India, when it had dance, it was in a very pedantic nationalist mode of authenticity. This is formally austere classical dance or folk dance, et cetera. Um, so I think when we take these, bring these serious modes of reading to objects that are not taken seriously, uh, we actually discover the extraordinary labor that undergirds popular culture. And we can take that to hip hop videos, we can take it to kung fu films, we can take it to comic routines, the Marx Brothers, but we can also take it to the work, the shadow figures, the ghost figures beyond, behind philosophical treatises, behind political manifestos, the work of great men, right? Erases a lot of the other collaborative work that's gone into it. So I'm hoping that that's the framework that anyone who's who doesn't watch Indian films or doesn't know about Indian film dance will still find help. Thank you for that. And I'll turn it back to Jennifer and I will return at the end. That's wonderful. We have uh, a question from the audience. I'm gonna give you two to answer. One is about uh, the relations between the dancers, especially homoerotic desires that are activated in these triangulated threesome queer scenarios, such as the contest um, with the suggested lyrics also of Shami Kapoor. So that's one thing. And then the other is, I think, somewhat related around the production of sexuality and sensuality in these numbers. A lot of people ask you to talk about the difference between um, Helen's dancing, which seems to be sensual but never lurid, and the productions of item dancers that seem to be uh, you know, more and more frequent. So we'll start there with those two. OK. Yeah, uh, the the title and the, the cover image of the book, I'm hoping conveys this kind of 
queer utopian energy of dancing women. Um, the ideological reading always brings in the man as the spectator, whether within the film or in the audience. What happens when we just decenter the male gaze altogether? We discover these entire networks of deep relationships between the women. So uh, chapter five is between a female choreographer and the stars, Saroj Khan and Madhuri Dixit. And these are all extremely queer relations also in terms of class, because um, these are women who are being, I'm not at all erasing class differences between them. It's not as if the backup dancer or Helen gets paid the same, um, the same kind of amount of money for a film as Vaijanti Mala does. But by reading them alongside each other, you also destabilize the heroine's kind of place as this prim and proper diagram of Indian femininity. And you displace completely that heterosexual matrix, which places the, the heterosexual couple at the heart of the dance number. By moving to this production number, the show number, the men are removed from the equation. It's kind of between the, the female choreographer, the female dancer, and the backup dancers. So those black and white images that I showed you are from a series. For example, the choreographer is practicing with her female assistants and later that. it gets placed onto a heterosexual couple. Um, but it actually reveals to us the very many other kind of intimacies that are happening behind the scenes, right? And that um, Gayatri Gopinath, Shohini Ghosh have written about this extensively. How do you kind of produce an oppositional reading and how does popular Indian cinema actually provide a rich space for those oppositional readings. You don't have to struggle hard. It's written all over them, in fact, right? And with male uh, item dancers now, Shah Rukh Khan in a, in a song called Darde Disco, The Pain of Disco in Om Shanti Om, I'd shown a friend of mine and he said, this is the most gay dance number I have ever seen <laughs> in a film that doesn't talk, that doesn't kind of engage openly with the question of homosexuality. So there are ways of, of counter reading that are already scripted, I think, into these numbers. And that's what explains our pleasure in them, not as these kind of fixed objects uh, for the male gaze. Um, the second question about item number, I love item numbers too. So I have no, I, I'm not gonna stay, I'm gonna disrupt those hierarchies for myself. Um, uh, you know, and in the book I talk, the final uh, kind of section of the book talks about the contemporary moment. Um, and I think what Helen is doing in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s is as scandalous then as the item number might seem now. Uh, but these regulations on the female body just continue even in these judgments of what is too much, what kind of movement is too much, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the item number does really interesting things in foregrounding the choreo musicing body because the dancer actresses need not necessarily be extremely talented or well-trained in dance, but it's the editing. It's the very jiffable kind of just tossing your hair uh, and the editor is doing all the cutting. So Saroj Khan actually was disappointed with contemporary item numbers. She said, I don't have much to do anymore because all of this is just brought to the editor's table and it's all created in post-production. I don't think that's a problem. I actually love TikTok video recreations of dance, just particular gestures because we're all all taking from it what we want. So I'm just kind of excited by the profusion of interactions that dance makes possible. Uh, but there is a question though, this point about Helen never being lewd, it, you hear it all the time in Indian journalism as well. Everyone else looked salacious and lewd and body and Helen did. And I think it has very much to do with her, with the manufactured whiteness of her body. So this kind of lean silhouette, and it's and we can talk about it if it's coming up in another question. I can stop now <laughs> and talk about Helen's racial coding, if you like, in a bit. But it's very much that the kind of excessive corporeality of the Indian vamp versus the mixed race Helen was always the, everyone else is too fat or too bul bulging in all the wrong places. But Helen is just the right kind. And I think it is a because she looks so much like any Western cabaret, Western in a very broad stroke kind of um, description, right? Yeah, that's a whole nother question around the circulation of what becomes Western or national dance and the way Marta Savigliano, for example, talks about tango and political economy. Um, so, you know, I, I have a question about Bhangra and 
other things. But in the chat, people want you to talk a little bit more about your uh, wonderful neologism of the choreo musicing body and to uh, talk about maybe a little bit more the question you had around art cinema and breaking down some of these, um, which you do in, in many ways, but the ways in which we tr traditionally look at uh, or would even frame or think about uh, using um, ideas behind what constitutes, right, this movement. So can you say a little bit more uh, to read the question exactly about how the concept of choreo musicing body uh, can impact other media, perhaps, such as literature, art, uh, cinema, and so forth? Yeah, those are great questions. And I'm thinking as I go along, the choreo musicing body, the, the, the kind of problem I encounter in, do, in writing this is that there, aren't, there isn't very much work on Hindi film dance as, as, as mentioned, I think, elsewhere. But um, so it means that this one book has to introduce a whole bunch of things. But if I had a chance and if I had many more years to do research, the choreo musicing body would, would be its own book uh, because then it would involve ethnographic work on going and speaking to makeup artists, to carpenters. And that kind of work requires years of embedded kind of presence in Bollywood, in what is now called Bollywood, but in the Bombay film industry, tracing people who worked. These are not people who have interviews from in newspapers, magazines, online, et cetera, right? They're completely behind the scenes. So what I have proposed it here, uh, here is as a theoretical framework. I have, I've included interviews. I have read as many accounts as I could from technicians. But the real work I'm hoping is something that other scholars will take up. So it's kind of a, an invitation to where we can take this kind of work. And it's not at all limited to Indian cinema. It is, it's a kind of invitation to just think of, to do more industry um, and material history. And when we do those histories, then we dislodge these kind of hackneyed questions of agency of visibility, of why don't we see more women filmmakers? Why don't, did the vamp have agency? This isn't a simple subversion repression hypothesis, uh, but, but to kind of show that agency is a constantly shifting plane. And these women are shape-shifting through those with great dexterity. And that's what I admire about it. It doesn't, it doesn't allow me to fix them in any kind of narrative either, because the, the Brahmin Vaijanti Mala exerts a lot of her caste power over, you know, over the industry, but she also gets marginalized in other ways. So the choreo music in body, just to summarize, is, is something that is helpful for any kind of work, like I said, uh, in, you know, in what produces, how do we produce kind of lineage, lineage histories? When someone, so in literature, where does a particular writing style emerge from? Not just within this kind of individualized discourse of the particular individual genius author, but as a dispersed terrain that authors are picking from continuously. With cinema, it's easy to do because it's always been seen as a group kind of activity, a collaborative activity with still the director at the helm. But it's, it helps us think about the corporeality of the archive, for example, right? What voices get preserved, what get erased, what emerge as ghosts, and what happens when we track those voices. Um, and I think it's the same that applies to the to art cinema. When we take the choreo musicing body, when we take corporeal histories to a very kind of um, auteur-centered, formally austere kind of mode of storytelling, um, it kind of erases the the labor that goes behind this. Of course, we have ex excellent, interesting anecdotes of cinematographers or editors but rarely of other kinds of technicians or of actors. So I'm also interested in thinking about, for example, what does Japanese theater bring to Kurosawa's uh, choreography of action sequences? That's how we take this corporeal history further, right? We think about performance as, and cinematic performance as a deeply intermedial terrain. These bodies have been trained in certain things. Let's bring their long histories into the stories that we tell. Yeah, I think that form of intermedial reading for performance studies more broadly and dance in particular is really important and, and for film. Um, we should be wrapping up in just a moment. We do have one last question, which is asking you to elaborate a little bit more on the quote unquote Western body of Helen 
versus the Indian heroines. So you've talked a lot about how they were uh, filmed and staged and where the camera goes and, and you know, certain kinds of interactions between them. Um, but I think it also bears on the question for me of, um, you know, what is this making it quintessentially Indian cinema? How does it translate? And you know, one one aspect is not is thinking about the films themselves as uh, material objects that circulate internationally. So maybe you can kind of put those two together about where we're we're seeing those boundaries. Uh, Absolutely. Um, so Helen is one of many what were just generally called Anglo Indian or Eurasian, mixed race is not really a historical term for that period, it's a much more recent term, but she is French Burmese and her roots are quite hazy, we don't know exactly. She's also infamously kind of reserved and she and Vaijanti Mala, it's really hard to get to interview them in person, like I interviewed some of the other actors, which also tells you something about the kind of worlds and narratives they've built around themselves. The interesting thing about Helen is that in the 50s, when she's featuring in black and white song and dance sequences, she's regularly featured as Southeast Asian or East Asian. Many songs are about her being a Chinese woman, a Burmese woman, et cetera. The eye makeup kind of emphasizes uh, the uh, slanting eyes, these kind of tip typologies of the Oriental woman. For Indian cinema, the Oriental woman lies there, right? So the Orient is a constantly shifting category as well. The Middle East and the and East Asia become the Orient for Indian cinema, uh, but with color film, a new kind of white um, Helen is manufactured. So she starts wearing blonde wigs, blue eye lenses, these light skinned body suits. She's always wearing body suits, so that's why I, I write about how she's such a modest man. Uh, in fact, she becomes the other to the Indian heroine in this period. So it's a the racial coding makes her both attractive for these kind of spectacular energies for this public intimacy, but they also remove her completely. They make her extraneous to the narrative so that she doesn't, she's just the gangster's mole. She's killed off. She often doesn't have a name at all. But I read her as part of a long lineage of the dancing girl, the notch girl. There's a 1973 Merchant Ivory documentary on her called Helen, Queen of the Notch Girls. So they kind of form this lineage of her to notch girls. Um, and there are other women throughout the book. There's an Indo-German Jewish Hindu dancing girl called Azuri. She is doing these complex negotiations. There's the there's fearless Nadia who's Greek Australian. So race is a shifting category, really interesting shifting category in the 19th, 19th and early 20th century. Um, and there are Eurasian women entertainers, Malka Jan, Gohar Jan, who actually take on Muslim names and kind of uh, enactments in order to reinvent themselves as celebrity entertainers. So it's kind of passing for Indian uh, rather than the passing as white. Uh, so it's not a neatly differentiated field. Um, white and mixed race women took on Hindu and Muslim names. There was shape shifting uh, and Hindu majoritarian pressures then kind of start to fix this ideal Indian woman as a Hindu woman as inside the space of the home, bourgeois private matrimony rather than these public spaces of intimacy. Right, so that's when the, the cabaret becomes a coded, uh, a kind of coded space. And it's similar for the, the Tawai for the Islamicate courtesan and the Kota, uh, who has to be rescued always into bourgeois conjugality. Uh, but there are these interesting moments when they're able to escape that kind of fixity uh, into normative diagrams that I really find interesting. So hyphenating, border crossing, mixed bodies, they all gesture to this messiness, the complexity of corporeal resistance. That's wonderful. Um, well, I think we have time for one more question. So can you talk a little bit more um, about cinema? You have a question here that asks uh, how you're reading. Um, if that's not too narrow, given the scope of your talk, um, these questions of the archaeology of multiple layers of bodies, race, movements, I think you've just answered this in a way, um, but to be attentive to dancers and actors and to what lies between the, behind them, the other bodies. For myself, I was so fascinated when you talk about the cutting in of other people's literal limbs and feet, um, you know, to expand the notion of, of uh, the singular, if you will. And I was so, this person is asking if you could talk a bit more about the notion of layers of historical and cultural depth 
embedded in the subtle movements, bodies, cameras, uh, and in the space. And if that layered investigation um, uh, is going to be useful for you as you move forward and think about the future of Indian cinema or collective parts of projects, future projects. Thank you so much for that connection to future projects because I'm constantly thinking about what I might take. And I think the Q and A in every talk that I've given actually gestures towards that. Absolutely. I mean, that's why I've, I constantly reiterate that the dancing body is not only a biological object. It's not a singular individual, but I'm interested in that singular individual, the history of their training, how much they rehearse, et cetera. But I'm also interested in the folding of other bodies and not just gestures of humans, but also non-human elements, right? So that plaster of Paris column becomes a gesture. Every Indian who sees those two kind of slides and the stairs going up, they know exactly what that's gesturing to. These are virtual spaces. That's why I call them heterotopic spaces. They are spaces you want to be in. They're unreal virtual spaces. The counter sites, right? But they're also, so they're kind of disarticulating these real spaces of the fashion ramp, the playground, the bedroom. She rides on the floor as if she were in the bedroom, but it creates instead a danced kind of heterotopic utopian space of public intimacy. So it's, con it's important to hold these, absolutely hold these layers together of the human and the non-human, of gestures of the, the trained human body, but also the trained technology. So that we have these really interesting instances in the 50s when only the song and dance sequences are shot in color stock because it's really expensive uh, because India has all of these foreign um, foreign trade, there, there are kind of embargoes on trade with foreign countries. So color comes very late, but it is imported at great expense just for the song and dance sequence. So I'm thinking of these layers and I'm moving into a project that studies Indian cinema in the Caribbean and the impact of Caribbean forms on Indian film. So already in some of the GIFs you might have seen, there are people passing as black in the, in the background. Uh, there are now a lot of white Caucasian backup dancers who come from Eastern Europe, Russia, even America, to just be backup dancers in Bollywood, which is an interesting kind of mirror to those Anglo-Indian women in the 1930s, right? Paid much lower. They could never be the heroines of these films, but they have this kind of desire to be in this. So I'm thinking about how these performance histories are actually, it's a two-way traffic between these regions of the Caribbean and South Asia via Africa. So we kind of form networks and pathways when we talk about corporeal histories. So people don't know that certain songs, hit songs in Hindi films are actually drawn from Calypso and Soka songs, or that singers from, uh, from the Caribbean actually performed in Hindi film. And it's gonna be very hard to find. These are subterranean underground networks, right? So these people don't leave traces in the archive. Um, so it's really about tracking down people who might still be alive and have stories or cultural memories. And these are ways to tell different stories, once again, about race and ethnicity that decenter white as the only norm that these cultures are speaking to each other around. Yes, it's it's like also the discovery of discovery of, of bond grip with the inter interdisciplinary aspect of that with a lot of contemporary African American sim, sim, singers and Bangra and you know it is a much more transnational story um, between these musics and cultures and dancers especially. Um, so thank you so much. We will very much look forward to reading your next book. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Roland, but here it is. Thank you so much uh, for your time today, for everyone's time, and I'll um, turn it over to Roland. Thanks, Jennifer. And Usha, before we finish, uh, I want to invite you to just say a couple of words briefly about your experience this year, because we, uh, for the benefit of those uh, people uh, watching who are not necessarily from Stanford, uh, our two institutions that are co-sponsoring this event, the Stanford Humanities Center and the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, are um, both important research institutes located at Stanford. But it's not that common for a fellow to be working on a project and to concurrently hold fellowships at those two centers. And I'm wondering, it's, it's been such a challenging year for everybody so far and looks to be, continue to be challenging probably for the rest of the term of your fellowship. I wonder if you could reflect a little on the experience of being at both centers at the same time. Um, 
it's been interesting, <laughs> as has the pandemic for all of us in so many ways, I think. Um, and the, all, all of the three sponsors for this talk, like I mentioned at the start, have been really important spaces for research. And I think the reason we need these centers is for precisely this kind of intermedial work, right? To have conversations across spaces and across departments with other people. And I think Zoom has actually been really helpful. I'm one of those people who, <laughs> and I don't have to teach this year. So I completely am checking my privilege um, of not having as much screen exhaustion as those who have to teach. But Zoom has actually broken down some of those walls of privilege and allowed many more of us to access and temporal difference as well to access uh, talks to engage with activists from around the world and what yes. has been a really exciting time and so for me I'm, I'm using it as an opportunity to learn from fellow fellows at both centers um, and but to engage with all of the rich conversations and i think with, we're still trying to engage via email or distanced meetings with each other, uh, following up from these conversations. Um, so I, I can't thank you enough for doing as much as you are doing to still make it you know, a really engaging experience. And I think the question of technology is really important just even to the protests that have happened in the US uh, this past year, that in some ways it has been enabling and it's allowed us to engage in deep conversation and study with each other. Um, so for people to have stepped out despite the, the kind of risk of COVID-19, but then to also sit back and listen um, that, that all of these centers have made possible, all three centers have made possible, um, is, gives us, shows us things that we can take into the future, I think. Yeah, and we're, we are so grateful to have you this year uh, and uh, so, so enriched by your presence in our weekly discussions among the fellows and, uh, and, and especially for the opportunity to hear about the work just concluded and to hear a bit about the work in progress. So thank you so much for this. Uh, as we conclude, I want to thank uh, my co-host, Professor Jennifer Brody, the director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity for her co-hosting job. Um, and above all, of course, I want to thank Professor Usha Iyer for uh, uh, this, this uh, memorable uh, event today. Today we're trying something different, and everyone who registered for today's event was automatically entered into a drawing to receive one of three signed copies of Usha Iyer's book. And so I'd like to announce today's winners. They are Anna Kimmel, Gabe Groner, and Daphne Dembo. Congratulations to the three of you, and we will be in touch by email about getting the book to you. And now before we go, let me remind you, please hold March 31st for the next Inside the Center event uh, featuring Marcy Kwan, Assistant Professor of Art History at Stanford, and also like Usha, a current Humanity Center Fellow. Uh, Professor Kwan will be discussing her forthcoming book, Enchantments, Joseph Cornell and American Modernism. And in the meantime, I'll, another one of our series, All This Rising, The Humanities in the Next 10 Years, continues with Ricardo Padron of the University of Virginia, the author of a recent book on the colonial Spanish Pacific. His lecture on February 24th is titled The Phenomenology of Distance in Early Modern Hispanic Geopolitics. Uh, mo more events are being added to the calendar all the time at both centers, and uh, I'm sure I speak for Professor Brody in saying I hope you will want to join us again in the coming months. And as always, check our two websites, uh, Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity is at ccsre.stanford.edu, and of course, the Humanities Center is at shc.stanford.edu. Check, uh, check uh, our sites for the latest updates. Until next time, thank you. Thank you everyone.